All right. Hey, Mercy Hill Online and in person. Hey, before we do anything else today, uh, we're going to take just a minute and we are going to pray uh, for our nation. We're going to pray over the inauguration that's coming up. We're going to pray for peace uh, in our land. All right. I don't know about many of you, uh, but for me over the last year, there have been many times where I feel like uh, I can really identify with the prophet Habakkuk uh, who looked up at the Lord and he looked at his nation uh, and, and he said, man, it feels like there is violence and destruction. God, when are are you going to intervene? We have uh, lived through a year where we have seen riots uh, really throughout the whole nation. We've seen them all year. And then in the last couple of weeks, we've seen something like that, a riot spill uh, over into uh, even the capital. And I don't know about you, but as a believer, we have got to be a people who pray that God will unleash uh, his grace and his common grace that we would see peace in our land. Breaks the heart of God, no matter where it's coming from or when it was over the last year to see lawlessness and violence and destruction. Uh, it is not his intention for humanity. Uh, and so we need to pray that God will not stay his hand, but that he will come in his grace uh, and begin to calm things down in our nation. We also want to pray uh, for our leaders that they will choose wisdom and that they will be kept from sin, okay? Uh, and so what I would wanna do just here for a minute uh, in the presence of all of us, all of our campuses online as well, man, let's pray that we'll be the church as well, salt and light, that we will be peacemakers during this time. We are in the world, uh, not to inflame, but something about us ought to turn the temperature down as we speak in truth and in love, all right? So let's go into a time of prayer together before we do anything else. Father, we pray that you will move your hand. God, we live in a nation that is given to violence. Father, we live in a nation, it is undeniable, that is given to chaos. And Father, we are in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Father, we pray today that you would lavish common grace upon our nation that would bring peace to our land. And Father, we pray that you would give wisdom to those that are in leadership. God, and keep them from sin. And Father, I pray that during this time, your church would embody what it means to be peacemakers. Jesus, you said that who, those who live by the sword will die by it. Let us be salt and light. God, let us make a difference in this world because we're here. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. I hope these will be our prayers that God over the next uh, couple of weeks. Guys, we're going to dive into our sermon for today. Uh, we're going to be in uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. So if you have a copy of scripture, you can turn with me there. One more thing I need to do before we uh, get into the scriptures here as you're finding that. Uh, regroup is, uh, is about to culminate in our groups launching and we want everybody at Mercy Hill uh, to be a part of that. All right. Your spiritual growth is at stake this year. We say this all the time. All right. Mercy Hill, uh, the Discipleship happens in community. Uh, relationships are so important for your spiritual walk. Uh, and that could not be more important than it has been uh, right now in 2021. All right, I know the new year has started, uh, but if you haven't noticed it, we're facing some of the same things that we faced in 2020. And we are going to need each other. There are people that are going to need you uh, and you are going to need others. And so it is important that we regroup together. Hey, listen, I know many of you uh, are still worshiping from home. Uh, I saw a thing this week that said about 30 37% uh, is the number that churches are having in terms of attendance in the building uh, as they were pre-pandemic, okay? Uh, so a lot of people are kind of coming back. They're slowly starting to come back. But the truth is a lot of people have left the building uh, even though they have not left the church, all right? And that's many of you. You're at home. You're online. Uh, hey, that means that group is even more important for us than it has ever been, okay? People have left the building, but they have not left the church. But man, if we leave the group as well, uh, we could end up really isolated. So let's regroup together, okay? We have groups that meet online. We have groups that meet in person. We have groups that do both. Uh, we've got a group for all types of people, man, life stage, all of that. Uh, so let's regroup together, okay? Uh, here's the deal. Regroup is for people who have been in group for a while. Uh, if you've been in group and you're like, man, I've been at Mercy Hill for a while. What is, was regroup? I thought we just did this like this summer or whatever. Hey, regroup is the new rhythm by which we kind of re-up for group every time. Uh, you're, for you, if you're newer, if you're uh, I've been around Mercy Hill for a while, you've been in a group, you're going to be like my family, okay? Uh, you're going to be like probably 85% of the rest of the church. 
man, you're just going to go back to the same group that you've been a part of for a while. There's nothing different for you, okay? But there's another group that maybe you tried a group, you fell out of group. Life happened, man, it gets in the way. Maybe you were committed to a group, but it just is like, man, it wasn't a great fit. You feel like you know it wasn't a great fit. You kind of feel like they know it wasn't a great fit, but you're really not sure what to do. You feel kind of weird about it. Uh, Y'all, that's the beauty of regroup. Our leaders want you in a group more than they want you in their group, okay? So if you need to make a change, new night, new time, If you need to make a change, that's fine. Let's get into a group. And the final group uh, of people here that I want to mention is just those of you that are brand new, okay? This is your chance to experience authentic Christianity. Some of you guys might be a college student that are like, man, I'm just kind of coming around. Some of you have been in church before. You've never been in church before. You're thinking to yourself, is this all it is? Watch a sermon, you know, or maybe go to a service or whatever. Hey, the way you go from being on the fringe to being in is getting in a small group. The small group is the place where we take the truths that we're learning from the Bible and we drive them into the practice of our lives. Uh, And we would love for you to dive into one of those. There are groups all over the triad. Uh, Hey, so man, let's regroup together as a church. Uh, Let's dive into Ecclesiastes chapter two. And I wanna talk to you today about what possessions will never produce, okay? Ecclesiastes chapter two, what possessions will never produce. Today, we're gonna dive into a passage that I think is so pertinent for where we live. Uh, Solomon was kind of the first American American, okay? Uh, he sort of had this idea and belief, I'm going to try to figure things out. And when that don't work, okay, if I can't figure it out, I will feel it out. If I can't answer the question of why I'm here, I'm sure going to, en- if I can't answer it, I'm sure going to enjoy the question, okay? And I'm just going to live for the moment. I'm going to live for pleasure and I'm going to live for possessions. He tried that. Uh, and many of us have tried that. We're a nation who kind of tries that. What's the point of life? Why are we here? What's the meaning? Well, I'm not sure but I'm going to try to enjoy the ride. Maybe I'll find meaning in pleasure and possessions. The problem, of course, is that all of us inherently probably already know that we've tried that before. (laughs) Okay, it's funny. It's a little bit ironic. We keep going back to the same well for satisfaction, even though it didn't satisfy last time. I mean, that's kind of weird, isn't it? It's like, man, if it was going to satisfy this time, it probably would have already done it, but it didn't. Because many of us gain things in life and all it does is create new desires. You know, uh, Christmas time kind of produces this, I think. Uh, You can kind of see it very easily. I don't know about you. I don't know if you got uh, a Christmas present that you love to give or one that you received. Uh, Probably all of us have one that we really were excited about. I was planning one for a few months. uh, And that, of course, is to give the Walker Texas Ranger poster to my nine-year-old son. Okay, so he uh, he really loved uh, the the Walker uh, poster. Uh, Somebody Somebody asked me, man, do you give your kids gifts so that you can have sermon illustrations? And it's like, you don't need a pretext to give a Walker poster, okay? Let's just be honest about that. Uh, you know, many of your kids wake up and they look in the mirror. My kids look deep into the eyes of Walker for at least 10 seconds before they leave the house. So uh, anyway, no, it's, it is a cool, cool gift, fun gift. I don't know what gift you gave uh, to your family or one that you received, but here's what I know as I was thinking about Christmas time, thinking about possessions, all of that. Here's the reality. Every Christmas, every kid, and all we are is grown-up kids. Three weeks later, are you really any better off than you were? I mean, is your life really any more meaningful than it was because of a possession? Now, think about an adult. I mean, think about, you know, whatever it is, a house, a car, a vacation, or whatever. Does your life actually have any more meaning three weeks after the experience of pleasure or possession is over? Of course, you know, uh, generally speaking, honestly, it's like, man, no, <laughs> no. Uh, Why? Because pleasure and possessions were never meant to be some type of ultimate satisfactory answer for why you're here and why we toil under the sun. Here's the big idea. Pleasure and possessions are not ultimate and they will never satisfy. Can I caveat that real quick? Okay, I know that I speak to an economically diverse audience and I understand that the pandemic, like many tragedies, hurts the poor more than anybody else. We're talking about materialism today and by materialism, I don't mean wanting a roof over your head. I don't mean needing to close on your back. I don't mean needing food in your stomach. Those are not false promises, okay, Uh, that you'll never satisfy or whatever. No, no, no. Uh, Those are things that I think every child of God should have. It's one of the reasons why our church tries very hard uh, to be involved and bless uh, people in our community uh, and bring signs of the kingdom. When I'm talking about something that promises satisfaction but won't, I don't mean that. What I mean is the excesses of our day that we continue 
continually go back to time and time again. We seek in pleasure and possessions uh, as if they are divine. We seek in them something that can only be found in God himself and in his kingdom. We want more and we want more and we want more. Many of us might be on the treadmill of that. You might be on the hamster wheel of that. It's like the Rockefeller quote. How much money does a man need? One more dollar, <laughs> right? One more dollar. That's what we need. How many of us, that's honestly kind of where we are or where we have been. Maybe you wouldn't say it like that, especially if you're a Christian. Does your life reflect that? All right, does your life reflect those beliefs? Uh, what I want to talk to you about today is this. Man, our church, sometimes, you know, our culture, sometimes even the church, y'all, we go to these wells again and again and again, even though they don't satisfy. How many of us feel trapped by the notion that we will be happy when? We will be satisfied when? All right, our life will make sense when? I get this or I do that when facing the hopelessness of potential meaninglessness. We wanna to turn to wisdom first, but man, a close second is more vacations, more square footage, a newer vehicle, better gear, something else for our kids. It will never satisfy. And Solomon is gonna show us that, all right? Let me show you. Ecclesiastes chapter two. Let's read this whole passage all the way down to verse eight. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, all this was vanity. I said of laughter, it, will, uh, it is mad and a pleasure. What use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine. My heart still guiding me with wisdom. I think that means maybe he wasn't getting totally smashed. He was trying to be more of a connoisseur and how to lay hold on folly till I might see see what was uh, good for the children of man to do under heaven during these few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses. I planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks more than any who had been seen before, more than any who had, uh, had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. Y'all having searched for wisdom and not seen the answer of the point of life there, Solomon goes for it, okay? The idea is if I can't find out the answer, I'm gonna enjoy the question, all right? I'm gonna dive, dive head first into frivolity, one uh, commentator said. I'm gonna, you know, in our day, it's like this. What he's kind of got is this idea of I'm gonna go for, you remember that song, Live Like You Were Dying? I'm just gonna do it all. I mean, Rocky Mountain climbing and skydiving and the whole thing. I'm just gonna go for it because I couldn't figure out the answer when we don't find satisfaction in wisdom. It's easy for us to turn to the world. When we don't find it in wisdom, we will want to turn to the world, okay? Uh, and, I, and I look at this and I think, man, for our day, that means, and I think many of us could fall into this, man, I'm not sure what the point of life is, so let's just live for the next vacation. Let's distract ourselves with another Netflix comedy, you know? I, I think about, you know, the next experience. Uh, I keep seeing these things pop up on YouTube about how many millennials now in the telework world because of the last uh, year. Man, they're wanting to go total freedom. I mean, they're wanting to become nomads and live in vans and drive around the world and, and spend all of their time on, on travel because they can work from anywhere. Now, let me ask you, is any of that really wrong? I'm not saying those things are wrong. What I'm saying is they will never satisfy. We're gonna get into this, man. There is a place for pleasure. There is a place for possessions. It's just that it's not going to end up asking, or it's not gonna answer the question that Solomon asked in chapter one, verse two, which is what do we gain from all the toil? You know, what is the point of us being here? We raise kids, we go to work, we plan day trips, we go to school. But as Solomon asked, what is the point if I can't understand the answer, maybe I'll just try to enjoy the question. I'm gonna laugh my way through the ride. That's kind of what he said. Look what else he said in verse four. I made great works, I built houses, planted vineyards. Verse five, I made myself gardens and parks. I bought male and female slaves. Verse seven, I had great possessions, herds and flocks. More than any who were before me, I also gathered for myself silver and gold. Man, he's got treasures from all over the world. I got singers, both men and women, concubines, the delights of man. Solomon would say this, I have done it and seen it all. Entertainment, experiences, houses, possessions, vineyards, servants, gold, silver, sensual pleasure with many women. Solomon, as I said in the intro, is the true American. Okay, he's the first in line. Man, what's the point of life? I'm not really sure, but I'm gonna go for it. Hedonism has many rooms and Solomon has visited all of them. 
And we, like him, many times in our culture are pleasure mad. Solomon went first. We can learn something from him, okay? He went after it. Now, I, I, I mentioned this earlier. I want to say it again, all right? Are these things inherently wrong? Well, obviously, when you read through this list, you're like, yeah, a couple of them are inherently wrong, okay? Uh, and we know that. Uh, you think, for example, uh, what he says about concubines, and, and this is uh, mirrored all around the world. You see all around the world these situations and institutions where many women are paired with one man, no matter what you end up calling it. It's not God's heart. It breaks his heart. You go back to Genesis. This was not God's design for men and women. Uh, it's not right. So yeah, that's not, it's not right. Obviously, another thing that Solomon said in here is about buying male and female slaves. Man, buying and selling the image of God is and has always been wrong. We praise God that the gospel produced faith in people like William Wilberforce to crack the very foundations of slavery in the West. These things are wrong. So when you say, hey, is this stuff wrong to chase? Well, some of it is inherently wrong, but I want to zoom out and I want to ask this question. I just want to put it in your head. I'm going to kind of footnote it here. But what if you zoom out and ask the bigger question? Wait a minute. Is having possessions wrong? Is desiring a new house wrong? Is being single but wanting to be married wrong? Like, are those things inherently wrong? And what I want to tell you today, I know that many of us have struggled with this because if you're a Christian, at some point you've asked yourself the question, wait a minute, how can I be satisfied with God and yet I know I also have desires in the world? Like there are things that I still want and desire and yet I'm satisfied with the Lord and he is ultimate. How do I solve that? Well, I, I'm, I'm gonna bring it up again at the end of the sermon. I just want you to know I'm thinking about it, okay? Because I know it's been in, in many of your minds. We need the wisdom of God uh, here. We will never understand the answer to that the wisdom of God, without the wisdom of God. Uh, hold that thought, we're gonna get there. But first I wanna take you to kind of the bottom of where Solomon ends up with all of this crazy living. He ends up in verse nine, so I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. All all my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, here we go, all was vanity. It was a striving for the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Vanity, striving for the wind, nothing to be gained. This is what Solomon cries out to the American culture and in some sense, the American church today. And he's saying this, hey, I have been where many of you are desperately trying to go. <laughs> I've already come to the end of that road. And when I got to the end of that road, guess what? Without the wisdom of God, you're gonna end up in a place where you realize this too is vanity. This too is meaningless. This too is not the point. This too is futile, meaning it has lost its intended purpose or that purpose has become frustrated. It is not what you think it is going to be. It is chasing the wind. Remember what I said last week? You ever seen kids chase bubbles? You know, you're out, remember you're out, you're out, the sprinklers go and water slides and the kids are chasing bubbles around, uh, around the yard or the neighborhood kids or whatever. Man, the second they catch it, all there is left to do is go chase another one. There ain't nothing to it. You're chasing it, you catch it, and all it is is left to do is to go and to chase another one. And that is kind of the point of what Solomon is getting at here. Here's what I want to show you by way of application today, all right? Enjoy pleasures and possessions, but only to the glory of God, okay? Enjoy pleasure and possessions, but unlike Solomon, only to the glory of God. I want you to think about Solomon, what he was trying to do. Are pleasures, pleasures and possessions the inherently wrong part of all of this? No. The inherently wrong part of this is thinking that in them we're going to figure out the answer of what we gain by living this life. That is what they will never give us. I want you to think about Solomon here, and I want you to think uh, real, real hard and realize, man, he went first. You ever been in a situation where it's like, Man, a bunch of kids about to jump off of something, you know, and, and you're like, man, I think it's okay. I think it's safe. Why don't you go ahead and go, you know? Why don't you go? I'll go, I'll go after you go. Uh, that kind of idea. That's sort of, what, that's sort of what Solomon does for us here. Y'all, many of us are desperately trying to go where he's already been. He's already jumped in. He's already told us what is there, and he's telling you this is very, very dangerous. He is calling out to the college student who has thrown off all restraint and has decided, man, I'm going to live for the moment. Debauchery will be the name of the game for my four years that are here. He is calling out to the men and women who are working themselves to death night and day. Why? Because another vacation is going to fix it, because more square footage is going to fix it, because a newer lease, a newer car, whatever it is, it's going to fix it. He is calling out to all the young 
young professionals that are making bank on Bitcoin right now, sitting there day trading on Robinhood. And the point is what? Why are they doing that? Well, because more money means I can buy more freedom. He is calling out to you today and he is saying, man, those things, the rest of the Bible, and I think eventually he's even gonna get there. Those things are not inherently wrong. What is wrong is thinking that you will grab something divine from them. And Solomon knew that. Y'all, Solomon is a man who had no unmet fantasies. Think about that. There was nothing that was kept from him, and yet nothing could satisfy his thirsty soul. For Solomon, there was no forbidden fruit, and yet the height of worldly pleasure was what? It was chasing after the wind. This is a timely word for our culture. And I want, you, I, want to hear, I want you to hear me again, okay? When I'm saying materialism and chasing something, I don't mean a roof over your head and a shirt on your back and a little bit of food in your stomach. There are basic needs that need to be met. I think from this passage though, what we can understand is this passage is about the excesses in life and the false promises that we think they will give us, the things that they, they promise that won't deliver on, all right? I, I, it's an insidious lie in our culture that something in a physical possession or something in a pleasurable experience will actually make our life make sense or that it will make life worth living. And yet we fall for it as a culture every single time. I mean, think about it. Think about the explosion of what a family thinks they need in terms of housing and cars and all of these things in the last 50 years. Think about the explosion of indebtedness. You explain to me how the richest nation on the face of the planet is also the most credit card indebted, okay? You you think about these things. Man, you think about uh, how, you know, people, uh, you know, man, the government's sending out checks like it's just going out of style. I mean, every time you turn around, and I'm not talking about people who might need something like that literally in order uh, to make ends meet or in order to keep, uh, like I said, a roof over their head, but I'm talking about everybody else. Man, a, a check like that comes in and maybe in our culture, it's already spent before it even hit there. Man, it's already gone. Even in the church, gone without one thought of how we could stimulate Hannah's Haven gone without one thought of how we might be able to stimulate uh, a church plant that we've sent out or a resident uh, at our church. Y'all, I think about these things and I think about how we have got to be different uh, than the world in this area. And yet I find myself so many times even thinking like the rest of the world. You know, you think about during uh, COVID, you think about how many people did uh, stress buying in COVID, you know? It's like, man, I'm sad. I'm lonely, I know what's gonna fix this, you know, uh, I'm gonna go buy some. I mean, you think about our, our nation, it's like, man, you could not, during COVID, you know, during the height of like the lockdown, you could not find uh, a ping pong table, you could not find a kayak, you could not find a bicycle uh, from all around the country, okay? I know that because I was looking for them like the rest of y'all, okay? Uh, and, and I think you couldn't find, I mean, I, I talked to one of our pastors uh, in our sermon planning meeting, and he's like, oh yeah, man, I get it. Our family was quarantined, I'm sitting there for two weeks quarantined, And he's like, all of a sudden it popped in my head and I'm like, man, I know what will fix this. Uh, I need a new pair of CrossFit shoes. Immediately is on Amazon, click, buy. (laughs) You know, I was like, hey man, I'm exactly the same way. I mean, our family was uh, quarantined for three weeks over uh, the course of December. And I was like, bro, I get it, the stress buys. I almost bought a whole flock of goats from some dude in Randleman, seriously. (laughs) And, And I'm like, man, I get it. It's like, man, you're just sitting there like, man, I gotta do something. You know, we need something here. Man, that is the culture that we live in, even in the church. And yet what happens is this, we need more, we buy more, and it's a self-defeating cycle. How will we not understand that it didn't fix it last time, it won't fix it this time, you know? And we instill these things in our kids. Uh, I just think about where our culture is. I think about even where our, 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 our church family is. I think about where my family is. I know this sermon is sharp, but I mean, I'm preaching it to myself. Our, our family has been watching uh, over the last couple months, we've been watching, uh, over the last month, we've been watching uh, Little House on the Prairie. Okay, I don't know if you guys remember that show, uh, but Little House on the Prairie and, you know, uh, we're, we're watching it and it's, we watch an episode of we're all together home at night or whatever. And I'm sitting there at Christmas, like right during Christmas, watching a Christmas episode of Little House on the Prairie, literally like having an existential crisis. I'm like looking at their happiness and then I'm looking at like all the paper on the floor and the fact that our kids had to get rid of some stuff to make room for the new stuff the grandparents were gonna get. You know, and I'm looking at this show, if you've ever seen the show, and I mean, the show is like these kids, I mean, they don't have much and they're just like, Pa, you know, they're crying. They're like, you know, it's Christmas and they're just like, you're the greatest Pa. You know, you gave us a penny <laughs> and a candy cane, you know, and they're just like hugging him. 
And I'm just like thinking about our, our culture and, 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 our, and our church and our family and all of these things. And I'm just like, man, how much are we buying in to the idea of more is going to fix it? Think about this, man. I read this question the other day. I thought, man, this is a life-changing question if I've ever heard one. I mean, how many of us beg God for things in the past that we now take for granted? I mean, I want you to think about that. I mean, how many of us right out of college are like, man, if you ever, God, if you ever give, provide for us to make $30,000 a year, you know? God, if you could just provide a child in our life. God, if we got married. God, if we had a house. And then it's like, man, a year later, you look back at those things and how many of us take some of those things for granted after we beg God for them, you know? It's this idea. Pleasure and possessions were never meant to satisfy. They can be used in a life well lived before God. We're going to talk about that. But they were never meant to satisfy. Pleasure and possessions, they are not wrong, but they are not ultimate. All right? As simple as I can make this today, here's what I would say. Pleasure and possessions are not wrong, but they're not ultimate. The problem is that many of us are looking under the sun for what can only be found beyond it. And I mean this for those that are just coming in online. Man, those of you who don't have a background of faith, you're trying to figure out Christianity. Christianity. I, do this, I mean this for you. I mean it for the church as well. I mean it for our pastors. I mean it for our group leaders. Y'all, all of us living in an American society need a healthy kind of dose of reality here for us. How many of us are looking for under the sun what can only be found beyond it? We are looking for in possession something that only God can give and it will never satisfy. And I think about this passage because I say, man, this passage is really good for tell this passage. I mean, the one that we just got through, just all 11 verses or whatever. It's really good in chapter two for showing us what the answer isn't. Maybe it's uh, the book that we need, though, the whole book, and then by extension, the whole Bible, to tell us where the answer is. But much like I said last week, y'all, Solomon eventually will exhaust all of these things, exhaust wisdom, exhaust possession and pleasure. And eventually he's going to come to this idea. You know what? Man, the answer is that we would fear God. Fearing God means, and that's what he's going to say at the very end of the book. Fear God. It's not in pleasure and possessions. It's in fearing God. Fearing God means embracing his wisdom. Fearing God means being a God-fearer. Fearing God means in our modern vernacular, in New Testament vernacular, all fearing God means is, man, embrace Christ. Be a Christian. Live as a Christian reconciled to God. That's all that it means. What he's saying is what you're looking for in possessions will only be found in fearing God and being restored to the one who created you. Ever since the world uh, came into existence, ever since humanity came into existence, there was a great relationship with God, but it was fractured by sin. We were separated uh, from God in sin. And in that state, until that becomes fixed, there is a gaping hole in our life. We can try to fill it through wisdom. We can try to fill it through possessions, but it will never be filled. It will never work. The only thing that will fix it is to fear God, to be a God fear. The only thing that will fix it is to be restored to that original relationship that we were supposed to have with him in the first place. You know, so the, pre the question today uh, is like, well, wait a minute, we're looking for all this stuff in possessions and, and, and things like that. You know, there is a prized possession. The New Testament talks about this. That prized possession is your place in the kingdom of God that is secured by Jesus Christ, the son of God. All right. That's what it is. If you're looking for satisfaction today, I would say this, satisfaction is not under the sun, it is in the sun, okay? It is in the son of God. He is the one that can restore you to a proper relationship with God, thereby you can actually begin to understand possessions and pleasures. But until that day, if you're looking for something in them that you can only find in him, it will always elude you. Jesus Christ lived his life as a substitute for us. He never sinned one time, but lived on behalf of those who would sin. He died on a cross paying the penalty of our sin and in his resurrection. He secures for us the opportunity to come to him and, and, and take our place in God's family and to be restored, to fear God properly once again. And that is the treasure in the field. Jesus said in Matthew 13, it's like a guy who goes out in the field and finds a treasure and he looks at everything that he has in his life and he says, man, all the vacations, all the cars, all the kids' hobbies, all the gear, whatever it is, man, I would sell it all in order to have this. Why is it so important? God's people, God's place under God's rule. Why? Because that's what we were created for. We were created to be a human under his sight. 
under his reign, to glorify him with our life day in and day out. And until we have that, we'll be searching for something in possessions and pleasures that will actually never be found. It's why C.S. Lewis said of possessions and pleasures, man, the problem with materialistic people, the problem with materialism is not that they have too many desires. It's not that they desire too much. It's that they desire not enough. They don't desire enough. They make a bad trade. They trade for in possessions and worldly pleasure what is only meant to be found in a relationship with God and living as a Christian and a God-fearing person. You know, it's like the story in Mark chapter 10. Do you guys remember this story if you grew up in church? Maybe you didn't. This is the first time you've heard it. Uh, the story in Mark chapter 10, there is a rich young ruler. Man, the guy is sharp. Okay, in our society, uh, man, he would have been sharp, the right clothes, the right schools. Parents were Ivy League. They got a lot of money. He's got a lot of money. That's the type of dude he is. But he's come to the bottom of a lot of that stuff and he realizes, man, it ain't here. There's something that I'm missing. And he sees Jesus Christ teaching and he's like, man, this guy rebukes the teachers. I mean, he says that he does miracles. All he seems to care about is the poor and the lame and the maimed, uh, the maimed and the children. There is something in him that seems like there is a purpose in my life that is missing, but maybe in following him, maybe in getting restored to God some kind of way. And he comes to Jesus and he falls down before Jesus, if you read in Mark 10, and he says, Jesus, what must I do to be saved? What must I, what does be saved mean? What do I do to re be restored to God? What do I do to become a true God fearer? How do I do that? And there's some conversation that goes back and forth and the Bible says that he literally sees the love in Jesus' eyes. And finally, Jesus looks at him, he says, okay, one more thing. Man, you got a lot of stuff. You're a man that has great possessions. Man, you're on your way, all the riches. And he looks at him and he says, I want you to go sell everything you have and I want you to come and follow me. You'll get me, you won't have anything else, but you'll have me. You'll be restored. You'll be fearing God properly. Now, which is it? And like too many in our society, maybe even here today, maybe at our campuses or online, man, the guy drops his head. He's overwhelmed with grief. And the Bible says that he walks away dismayed. Why? Because he had a lot of stuff. He thought Jesus was valuable. He didn't think he was more valuable than everything else. And because of that, he made a bad trade. He decided in that moment, nah, I'm just gonna kind of continue to walk down Solomon's little sidewalk here. <laughs> in order to kind of see if this will lead me to the meaning and the point and the purpose that I desire. Let me close this, okay? Hey, is that you today? Man, some of you might not be uh, believers. You're just kind of checking things out. Is that you? Are you chasing in the world what can only be found in God? Are you looking under the sun for what can only be found beyond it? It didn't work last time. It's not gonna work this time. Hey, uh, every one of us, if you're at the campus, okay, uh, you came in, there's a little card right here. I want you to get this card out. Just hold it for the next couple of minutes. If you're online, uh, we were gonna try to mail you a card, but it probably would get there in like three months, okay? So, uh, you know, I literally heard people are now getting the invitation to Mercy Hills Christmas services in the mail. So those aren't for next, they're not for like the end of this year. Uh, they were for uh, like, you know, a month ago or whatever, a couple weeks ago. So, hey, but take this, uh, take this card out. You know what this card says? This card says, I will be satisfied if. Hey, if you're not a believer, you know what? There's probably a bunch of stuff that you think you can put in there. And what I want you to see is that whatever you put in there, the second you get it or don't get it, it'll change tomorrow. I mean, even if it's something outlandish, I bet you anything, you write something in there and maybe it takes you five years. But if you go and find that card, you're gonna look and you're gonna realize, Matt, wow, I got that thing, now I take it for granted. <laughs> you know, it didn't satisfy. It wasn't meant to. It wasn't created to. It's not strong enough to. Would you put something down? You know, if it, this is the thing. I, I want Christians to be able to look at this card and this is what I'm gonna tell our believing folks to do, to say, man, I would be satisfied if, and you realize like, man, I can just leave that blank for the rest of my life. <laughs> you understand? Like, man, I can just kind of leave it blank. There's a lot of desires I have. There's things I want in life. I'm not saying that. I got dreams, you got dreams. But man, the point, the purpose, satisfaction, counteracting vanity. No, I don't gotta write nothing down for that. Because as a believer, I understand I've been restored to God. I fear God. If you're not a believer, do you have that? You can come today, okay? We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to, to introduce you to this God. We'd love to train you in righteousness and disciple you. Man, we wanna be that church uh, for you. You gotta come to us and let us know. Believer, let me address you and then we'll be done. Uh, I wanna end on a super encouraging note for you, okay? Because for many of us believers, I, I raised this earlier, I think many of us have a question and the question is, man, if I am so filled with God, if I so seek Him, how do I reconcile that with the fact 
that I also know that there's stuff that I want in the world. Man, there's desires I have. I got things I want to do in life. I've got goals. You know, I thought about that for myself. It's like, man, uh, every single Saturday, I write the same things down that I'm praying for, big things for God. It ain't but about half of them about (laughs) y'all. Okay, the rest of them are for our family. They're for things I want to see in my own personal life. All of that, yeah, there's a bunch for the church. Man, is that wrong? I'm going to tell you today, it is not wrong. Man, desires and things that we want to see in this life, it is not wrong. It is just not ultimate. It can be used as part of a God-fearing life. And that's what I want to kind of end trying to show you today. True enjoyment is fulfilling the purpose for which you were created, all right? And you can fulfill that purpose in part with the enjoyment of pleasures and possessions that God gives you from his hand. They are part of a life that is well-lived before God. One of the scariest things for me about preaching this sermon, it really was scary. I talked to our sermon planning team and our elders about this, okay? My fear was that you might come away thinking the dreams that I have or maybe even things that I desire are necessarily wrong. I'm gonna give you a little formula here. I'm not, they're not necessarily wrong. They may be wrong. They may be something that you're not trying to embrace God's glory with. You're trying to replace God with. They could be like that. That doesn't mean they're necessarily like that. Pleasures and possessions are not inherently wrong. They can be used to glorify God in our lives. You say, well, where do you get this from? Well, you need the rest of the Bible, but Adam and Eve sure as heck, I think, enjoyed the garden, okay? I think, I think about the fact that we will uh, enjoy the new heavens and the new earth. I, I think about this. I think about Psalm 104, the blessings of God uh, just raining down so that humans uh, can flourish in the world. I think about 1 Timothy 6, where the Bible tells us not just to encourage the rich in order to be generous, but also to enjoy the blessings from God's hands. I think about Matthew chapter seven, where Jesus said, even evil people know how to give good gifts to their children. What do you think God's gonna do? Man, God can give us good gifts, but we will never understand how to enjoy the blessing from God if we are trying to replace God with it. If we are not embracing blessings, but we are replacing God with the blessing. You could say it like this. We should enjoy God's gifts from a deep satisfaction, not for satisfaction. If it is for satisfaction, okay, then we are understanding, wait a minute, this is wrong. I'm looking for in the world what can only be found in my relationship with God. But can we, from a deep place of satisfaction, allow blessings and pleasure and possessions in our life to turn our heart back to him? Can, can we be ones who say, God, I thank you for this. I'm overwhelmed with gratitude. You are an awesome God who gives good gifts to his children. You know, I thought about this, how I can put flesh on this, okay? In my family, all right, I think about just possessions that we have or whatever. And, and my family, uh, I think about, and many of you guys know, man, we live on a little bit of property. There's a lot of property around where we live. And, uh, and man, we've got a four-wheeler at the house, okay? Uh, I've, had, I've had four-wheelers. I've had ATVs kind of a lot of my life. And, um, and man, we have a four-wheeler there. Uh, it's super fun, okay? It's, 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 like a, one of, it's like a prized possession for me, if you want to say it like that, okay? Uh, I'll put it to you like this, okay? My truck sits out in the wind and the snow and the rain, and the four-wheeler is in the garage, very safe and warm at night, okay? Uh, it's, it's kind of one of those things. Um, but here's the deal. When we got the four-wheeler, uh, when we got the four-wheeler, uh, we didn't have... Um, we didn't have four kids at that time, okay? And they were very young. So it was fun to kind of putt around or whatever, but they were very young. You know, now there's four of them and they're a little bit older. And to go for a ride, I pretty much have to strap Benaya right to the front fender with a bungee cord, okay? Uh, and that's kind of what we got to ride. I tell them like, hey man, you better keep your mouth closed when we're going down the road. It's very, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough, you know, it's like, man, they're sitting everywhere and it's all this kind of stuff. And we have begun the conversation of thinking about in our family, hey, at some point, not sure if we will, don't know when, but thinking about, hey, would we want to upgrade this and, and have something that we could all kind of sit in a little more and we could kind of uh, have that. Now, that's kind of a conversation in our house. Well, put that next to this sermon. Me and Anna have been talking about it all week long. How do I know if that is something that we can glorify God in or how do I know if that is something that we would be as a family or I would be looking to for some type of satisfaction? And the answer is, that's a spiritual question with a spiritual answer. I think it is a personal thing. I think you're gonna have to put that before the Lord. Certainly there are people that act like they glorify God with things that they're really replacing him with, okay? And it's kind of a a tricky thing. But I did wanna leave you with two practical points, okay? Two questions that you can jot down that I think really get us down the road to this answer. The first question is this, without this pleasure or possession, can I still lay hold of eternal joy? Because that is what is promised to me and taking my place in the kingdom of God. 
And if all of a sudden there is something that is out there, there is some degree, there is some vacation, there is some four-wheeler, okay, whatever it is in your world, there is something that is out there that all of a sudden I think, man, without that, I don't know that I would be, I could be eternally joyful. Then all of a sudden I think we can realize together, man, that's not something we're embracing and glorifying God with and our heart is turned back to him through the enjoyment of it. Uh, certainly we can enjoy meals, we can enjoy vacations, we can enjoy possessions, but if it comes down to I will not be eternally joyful without that thing, we have an idol, we're replacing God with something in our life. Second question I think we can ask is this, does this pleasure or possession cause me to disobey God by not being generous? Man, if there is a pleasure or a possession that is out there, but in order to have it, you got to disobey. Man, you got to go into so much debt, you can't even uh, give to you know any anything in the church or anything in the community. Man, if if it's like man, because uh, we've got that, I'm not able to think about the multiply offering at the end of the year or whatever it is. Then I think what we would say is, man, I want that more than I want to take my place in the kingdom of God, all right? So Christian, man, for you, I would just call out to you today and I would say, man, for us, I think we can really wrestle with this, all right? Uh, is there something that might go in this blank and you know it? I hope you'll put this card somewhere, maybe this week, where you can see it. And every time you look at it, you think to yourself, man, I would be satisfied if, listen to what it doesn't say, what I'm not saying. I'm not saying I've got dreams, or I've got things I wanna see in my life. I've got even possessions that we desire. No, no, no. What I'm saying is, are you looking to them for satisfaction and ultimate meaning, the point of your life? And if there's anything that we can write down in here, then something is wrong and we need to repent of that and God will be gracious to forgive and restore, okay? I want you guys to see a testimony of that. For me, it was buying something. Golf was my sport, that's what I like to play. It was kind of my time to get away and then I would just have a need just to want to buy something. If I saw something that I wanted or wanted it to have, then I would find a way to get it. Whether it was, you know, save up to get it, sell something to get it. I would be doing those things, buying things and doing it and like not really look at the big picture of I'm taking things away from my family and, you know, even some of the, the things that you're buying, you know, whether it's on credit or whatever the case may be, is like it just kept getting deeper and deeper and further along. It was all about me. I was taking care of me. Each week was just picking away at me over and over and over again. And I was like, really, like, how could I tell her? It wasn't long after that that she found one piece of paper. She has explained this to me. I thought that I had hidden everything. I kind of blew up. I went off. We both very um, mad at one another. She got in the car with the kids. And then she says, when I get back, I want to know it all. Everything. I'm on my knees and praying. I'm like, there's not anything that I can do to hold anything back anymore. Like, this is it. So she comes home and we talk and um, all the bank accounts, everything was open to where she could see it all. And she looked at me and said, you know, we need to sell everything that, that you've got to pay back the debt that I got us into with that. We started going to counseling. The first thing he said to me, it's like, you gotta rest in forgiveness. It's like, God has forgiven you. You've been forgiven, but you gotta you got repent. And what needs to change? And at that time, you know, fully for me was like just the true repentance on my knees, crying out like, God, I'm yours. I'm, I'm done with this. It's all in your hands. I'm gonna be honest with you that since the true repent, like fully 100% giving it to God, he has set me free from that. Like the sense of peace that came over me when that was done and knew that I truly had given it to him. Like, I don't, I don't struggle with it like I did. But there has to be guards because you have the devil tries to come in and, and tries to steal our joy. It has to be an everyday thing of in the word and praying and accountability with me and my wife. Like everything is, is open. There's nothing hiding anymore with our finances. All, and I don't have to run. Just rest in that forgiveness in Christ as he's forgiven us for our sins and all the things that we've done, no matter what it was or is, 
when we turn it over to Him and fully give it to Him, then He'll set you free. He restored my family. Like He brought us closer together. He's mended our marriage, and, and He has done so many things that only God can do. The joy I have in that, I could care less if I ever played another golf game, ever. God has really showed us what He can do and, and, and how He can work as long as we give it to Him. At first, my wife didn't really want to go to counseling because the counseling was about me. She had always struggled with doubt with her relationship with Christ. And when we came back to the next counseling, she said that she chose to believe. She believed the Word and it was all true. I feel like at that time, you know, God had taken that away from her, that doubt that she had struggled with for so long and I'd seen for so long. She looked at me. She goes, I'm going to get baptized. At times we say, okay, I'm going to give it to God this time. And then we'll go right back into it again. But true repentance and knowing that we've been forgiven, resting in that forgiveness in God, that He is truly what we need, and He can give us all that we need, and fill those voids and give us the joy that nothing materialistic, no person, anyone can give but Him. When that happened, that took place, I was like, I'm going to sell everything I got, and I haven't looked a day back. Quit running, turn to God, and give it all to Him. He's all we need.